Mary sat in the bedroom, feet up, half reading a newspaper, half listening to the voices of her two sons and their friends playing Dungeons and Dragons in the kitchen below. So you get to the edge of the forest, but you make a truly stupid mistake, so I'm calling in the wandering monsters. Wandering monsters, thought Mary, and turned her newspaper. How about suffering mothers, divorced with low support payments, living in a house with children who speak in a foreign tone? Can I get wandering monsters called out for just befriending a goblin? The goblin was a mercenary for thieves, so be grateful you only have wandering monsters to deal with. Mary sighed, folding her paper. Goblins, mercenaries, orcs, you name it, she had it, down in her kitchen, night after night, as well as the rubble of a ruined city of crush bottles, potato chip bags, books, papers, calculators, and horrible oaths pinned to her memo board. If anyone knew in advance what it was to raise kids, they'd never do it. Steve's dungeon master, he's got absolute power. Absolute power. Mary stretched out her aching feet and wiggled her toes. As head of the house, she could be the one with she should be the one with absolute power. But she couldn't even get them to dry a dish. I feel like an orc. She had only a vague notion of what the creature was like, but it seemed to approximate the way she felt. Orcish. The subterranean voices continued with their deranged dream directly under her bedroom. What are these wandering monsters? Human, said the dungeon master. Ha, the worst. Listen to their qualities. Megalomania, paranori paranoia, kleptomania, schizoid. Schizoid, said Mary toward the wallpaper. The way I've begun to feel. Have I raised my babies to be dungeon masters? For that, I work eight hours a day? It wouldn't be so bad, maybe, if my own life were as... As spontaneous as theirs, with surprise calls from my admirers. She went down the list of her admirers, but had to admit there was something orcish about them, too. Okay, then. I run ahead of the humans and shoot just my little arrows at them to make them chase me. My lead, my lead arrows. My youngest son, thought Mary, listening to Elliot's thin, squeaky voice. My baby, shooting lead arrows. She felt as if she'd been shot with one right in the thyroid gland or whatever it was that ran her energy down into the pits where the orcs lived. She needed a lift so badly. I run down the road. They're after me. Just when they're about to get me and they're really mad, I throw down my portable hole. Portable hole? I climb in and pull the lid closed. Presto! Disappeared into thin air. If only I had one, she thought to climb into about 4.30 every day. You can only stay in a portable hole for 10 million, for 10 mil rounds, Elliot. All I need is it for is about 10 minutes at the office and maybe a little later in heavy traffic. She swung her feet off the bed in a firm resolution to face the evening squarely without any anxiety symptoms. But where was romance? Where was the exciting male in her life? He was waddling down the fire road. The road was silent now, his pursuers gone, but he could not last long in this atmosphere. Earth gravity would get to him, and the ground resistance twist his spine out of shape. His muscles would sag, and he'd be found in a ditch somewhere with no more definition than a large bloated squash. What an end for an intergalactic botanist. The fire road dipped, and he followed it toward the light of the suburb below. He swore at those lights which had so fatally attracted him and which attracted him now. Why was he descending toward them? Why did his toad tips tingle and his heart light flutter? What help could there be for him there in alien circumstances? The fire road ended in low shrubs and bushes. He crept through them stealthily, keeping his head low and holding one hand over his heart light. It fluttered enthusiastically and he cursed it too. Light he said to it in his own tongue. You belong on the rear end of a bicycle. The bizarre house forms of earth were directly ahead, held down by gravity, unlike the lovely floating terraces of... It was bad to think of home. Such memories were torture. The moth light of the houses grew bigger and still more compelling. 
he stumbled through the brush and down a sandy bluff, his long toes tracing outlandish tracks there upon a winding path that led toward the houses. Directly ahead of him was a fence he'd have to climb. Such long fingers and toes as he had were good for getting a grip on obstacles. He climbed like a vine to the top of the fence, but toppled down the other side, stomach upward, feet flailing. He hit, limbs splaying in every direction, a whimper of pain on his lips, and rolled pumpkin-like across the lawn. What am I doing here? I must be mad. He braked himself and froze on the alien ground. The earth house was awesomely near, its lights and shadows dancing before his terror-stricken eyes. Why had his heart light led him here? Earth houses were grotesque, horrible. But something in the yard was sending soft signals. He turned and saw the vegetable garden. Its leaves and stems moved in shy patterns of friendliness. Sobbing, he crept toward them and embraced an artichoke. Hiding in the vegetable bed, he took counsel with the plants. Their advice, to go look in the kitchen window, was not welcome. I'm in all this trouble, he signaled the plant because of wanting to peek in the windows. I can't repeat such folly. The artichoke insisted, grunting softly, and the extraterrestrial crept off obediently, eyes whizzing around in fearful circles. The square of kitchen light radiated outward, ominous as any black hole in space. Vertigo filled his limbs as he dropped into this unspeakable vortex at the outermost edge of the universe. His eyes came up past a plastic weather vane with a mouse and a duck balanced on it. The duck was out, carrying an umbrella. At a table in the middle of the room sat five earthlings engaged in ritual. The creatures were shouting and moving tiny idols around on the table. Sheets of paper were waved, bearing dark secrets, for each earthling kept hidden from the other what was printed there. Then a powerful cube was rattled and tossed, and they all watched its six-sided form land, just so. Again they shouted, consulted their tablets, and moved their idols as their alien tongues sounded in the night air. I hope you suffocate in your portable hole. Listen to this. Lunacy. Hallucinator, insanity, yeah, read some more. This form of malady causes the afflicted to see, hear, and otherwise sense things which do not exist. He sank down from the window into darkness again. The planet was unspeakably strange. Could he ever learn the ritual, throw the six-sided cube himself, and be accepted? Vibrations of monstrous complexity floated out to him from within the house, intricate codes and signals given back and forth. He was ten million years old and had been a great many places, but he'd never encountered anything as complicated as this. Overwhelmed, he crept away, needing to rest his brain in the vegetable patch. He'd peeked into earth windows before, yes, but never from so close, never partaking so intimately of the bizarre thought patterns of the people. But they are only children, said a nearby cucumber. The ancient botanist let out a whimper. If what he'd just heard were the thought waves of children, what most must those of the adults be like? What impenetrable intricacies awaited him there? He slumped down next to a cabbage and lowered his head. It was all over. Let them come in the morning, take him away, and stuff him. Mary showered, attempting to revive herself. Then, wrapping her head in a towel, she stepped onto the bath mat, which Harvey the dog had chewed to pieces. The ruined fringes played between her toes as she dried herself and slipped into her imitation silk kimono. She turned to the mirror. What new wrinkle, what tiny sag, what horrible erosion would she detect this evening to complete her depression? Damages seemed slight, but one never knew. One couldn't begin to anticipate the childhood atrocities that might overtake the house at any moment. Fights, drugs, unbearably loud music to hasten her physical and moral decay. She applied some outrageously expensive moisturizing cream and prayed for peace and quiet. It was broken immediately by Harvey the dog barking his head off from his exiled post on the back porch. Harvey, she called out the bathroom window. Shut up. The animal was ridiculously suspicious of things that passed in the dark. It made her feel the neighborhood was filled with strange characters. If he'd barked just at them, he'd be useful. 
but he barked at the pizza wagon, at airplanes, at faint satellites, and suffered, she feared, from hallucinator insanity, not to mention eating bath mats. She yanked the window open again. Harvey, for heaven's sake, pipe down. She slammed the window shut and left the bathroom. What lay ahead of her down the hall was not appealing, but she had to cope. She opened the door to Elliot's room. It was piled with objects of every sort of uselessness to the point of decay. A typical boy's room. She'd like to stuff it in a portable hole. She began. Organizing, discarding, filing. She hung his spaceships from the ceiling, rolled his basketball into the closet. She had no ideas for the stolen street sign. She hoped he wasn't paranoid or something. She suspected Elliot had much the matter with him, being fatherless, joyless, and having a penchant for hanging out with wandering monsters at his every free moment. Taken all around, he wasn't even nice. But maybe it was just a stage. Elliot, she called to her little orc. Of course, there was no answer. Elliot, she shrieked for him, thus raising her blood pressure and deepening the shriek lines around her mouth. Elliot's footsteps thundered on the stairs, then rumbled along the hall. He whipped around the doorframe, all four feet of him, adorable in some respects, none of which were visible at the moment as he looked suspiciously at what she'd done to his collection of trash. Elliot, do you see what this room looks like right now? Yeah, I won't be able to find anything. No dirty dishes, clothes put away, bed made, desk neat, okay, okay. This is what a mature person's room is supposed to look like all the time. Why? So that we won't feel like we're living inside a litter basket, all right? Yeah, all right. Is that a letter from your father? Mary pointed to the desk, to the handwriting she knew so well from all the master charge slips that it appeared on. What do you say? Nothing. I see, she tried casually to change the subject. You want to repaint in here? It's getting grungy. Sure. What color? Black. Cute. A healthy sign. I like black. It's my favorite color. You're squinting again. Have you had your glasses off? No. Mary! The dungeon master called from below. Your song is on! She leaned her head out the door. Are you sure? Your song, Mom! said Elliot. Come on! She heard faintly the sound of the persuasions coming from the kitchen. She followed the beat down the stairs, Elliot in front of her. Did your father mention you guys coming for a visit? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving? He knows Thanksgiving is mine. But what had he ever been consistent, except on the bottom line of charge slips where he'd worn out numerous ballpoints? Buying parts for his motorcycle. She thought of him zooming somewhere, moonlight on his heavy-lidded eyes, and sighed. Oh, well, she'd have Thanksgiving dinner at the Automat, or the Chinese restaurant, the turkey stuffed with MSG. Elliot ducked away from her, and Harvey started barking again in an approaching car. The extraterrestrial dove between rows of vegetables and flattened himself out there, arranging a few leaves over his protruding shape. There's nothing to fear, said a tomato plant. It's only the pizza wagon. Not knowing what a pizza wagon might be, the extraterrestrial remained in the leaves. The wagon stopped in front of the house. A door in the house opened and he saw an earthling emerge. That's Elliot, said the green beans. He lives here. The extraterrestrial peeked over the leaves. The earthling was only slightly taller than he was, but the earthling's legs, of course, were grotesquely long and his stomach did not hang on the ground in the elegant manner of certain higher life forms but he was not too terribly frightening to behold. The boy went down the driveway and out of sight. Go around the side, said the tomato. You'll get a good view of him returning. But the dog, the dog is tied, said the tomato. He ate Mary's overshoes. The extraterrestrial scampered out of the vegetable patch and circled the house, but the lights of the pizza wagon suddenly swept the yard as it turned in the drive and he panicked. Wrenching himself along, he leapt onto the fence and started to climb over. One of his long toes accidentally depressed the gate latch and he found himself swinging back into the yard. The earthling was near, was looking his way. Quickly, he covered his heart light, dropped from the gate and dove into the tool shed where he crouched, 
fearful mist surrounding him. He trapped himself, but there were tools in the shed, a digging fork with which to defend himself. In many ways, it resembled tools from his ship, for gardening is gardening. He gripped its handle and his long fingers and prepared to meet his attacker. A concerned intergalactic botanist is not someone to trifle with. Don't stab yourself in the foot, said a little potted ivy. He braced. From the garden, he felt the mental wave of a nearby orange tree as one of its fruits was plucked by the earth child. A moment later, the fruit hurtled into the tool shed and struck him in the chest. The little old being tumbled backward, sinking down on his large, squashy bottom, the orange bouncing off him onto the tool shed floor. How humiliating! A botanist of his stature pelted with ripe fruit. Angrily, he grabbed the orange, wound up one of his long, powerful arms, and whipped it back into the night. The earthling cried out and scampered away. Help, Mom! Help! Mary chilled all over. What acceleration of the aging process was she about to undergo? There's something out there, shouted Elliot, bursting into the kitchen. He turned, slammed the door, and locked it. Mary weakened deeply, looking at the Dungeons and Dragons display and desperately wished for a portable hole large enough for all of them. What was she supposed to do now? It hadn't been mentioned in divorce court. In the tool shed, babbled Elliot. It threw an orange at me. Ooh, mocked Tyler, the dungeon master. Sounds dangerous. The boys got up from the game and headed for the door, but Mary got in front of them. Stop. You all stay right here. Why? Because I said so. She drew herself up, tossed her head bravely, and grabbed the flashlight. If it was a burglar, she'd be the one to go out and frighten him away. You stay here, Mom, said Michael, her older boy. We'll check it out. Don't get condescending with me, young man. Alongside her, another of the dungeon crowd, young Greg, had grabbed a butcher knife. Put that down said Mary, and gave them her withering stare of absolute power. They pushed past her, opened the door, and rushed out into the yard. She followed, hanging on to Elliot. What exactly did you see? In there, he pointed at the tool shed. She shined her flashlight inside, onto pots, fertilizers, hoes, shovels. There's nothing in there. Michael's voice sounded across the lawn. The gate's open! Look at these tracks, shouted the dungeon master, rushing toward the gate. Their gross, tangled tongue meant nothing to him, but the ancient voyager could see their forms clearly now from his hiding place on the sandy hillside. There were the five earth children, and who was that exotic creature with them? His heart light began to glow, and he quickly covered it over. Deftly, he waddled closer to see more of this tall, willowy being who accompanied the children. She did not have a nose like a bashed-in Brussels sprout, nor the shape of a sack of potatoes, but he crept a little closer. Okay, party's over. Back in the house. Greg, give me that knife. The clang-banging syllables of her language were meaningless to him, but he sensed that she was mother to this crew. Where was the father, towering and strong? She threw him out years ago, said the green beans. Here's the pizza, said Greg, picking it up. Elliot stepped on it. Pizza. Who said you guys could order pizza? Mary passed under the porch light, and the extraterrestrial gazed at her from his hiding place, thoughts of escape temporarily set aside. Foolish heart light, he said to that peculiar organ, which fluttered now. You belong on... on a pizza wagon. Mary shooed them back into the house, satisfied that the worst had passed. Elliot had been fantasizing again. That was all, and had merely given his mother a few more frown lines. It was just a stage he was passing through. There was something out there, Mom, I swear! Tyler mocked. You're full of it, Elliot. Hey, said Mary, no talk like that in my house. They knew too much. They were out past her at every turn. All she could hope for was some kind of standoff, but she sensed it was impossible. All right, everyone, time to go home. We didn't eat the pizza. It has footprints in it, said Mary, desperately wishing to have quiet restored. But of course they ignored her and began eating the stepped-on pizza. She dragged herself back toward the stairs, feeling quite stepped on herself. 
She'd lie down, put some herbal pads on her eyes, and count iguanas. She turned to the top of the stairs. When that pizza's done, everyone out. A rumbling grumble sounded from the dungeon. How nice it must have been when children went to work at the age of nine. But those days, she felt, were gone forever. She stumbled into her room and collapsed on the bed. Just another typical evening in the life of the gay divorcee. Cold chills, shock, and wandering monsters. She applied her eye pads and stared blindly toward the ceiling. Something seemed to be staring back. But that was just her overwrought imagination, she knew. And if that damn dog doesn't stop barking, I'm going to leave him beside the highway with a note in his mouth. She breathed deeply and began counting her lizards, each of them shuffling toward her in a friendly sort of way. The Dungeons and Dragons game moved stealthily to the playroom, everyone playing but Elliot, who went to his own room, sulking. He fell asleep with odd dreams disturbing him, of immense perspective patterns, lines angling in to form doorway after doorway leading to... space. He ran through, but more doorways were always ahead. He was not the only one in a strained mood. Harvey the dog chewed through his leash and snuck off his back porch post. He tiptoed up to Elliot's room, slunk in, and pawed down. He contemplated Elliot's sleeping form, then contemplated Elliot's shoes, but eating them would only make waves. But he was nervous, ill at ease, needed distraction. He had not especially enjoyed his evening bark at the moon. Something weird had entered the yard, and Harvey's fur had stood up straight, little whimpers escaping his snout until he'd pulled himself together and begun yapping in the expected fashion. What had been out there? He didn't know. He began a half-hearted wash of tail parts, soft tongue slurping, teeth rounding up a few fleas. Then suddenly, he heard the sound again. Elliot heard it too, was sitting up in bed. Harvey growled, fur standing stiffly, eyes darting fearfully about. He needed to bite someone, settled for skulking alongside Elliot, out the door of the bedroom, down the steps and through the house to the backyard. The elderly space being had slept on the sandy hillside, but then had risen again and gone back toward the house. The windows had all been dark. He'd found the gate latch, depressed it with his toe in the correct manner, and entered, much as an earthling might. But his lumpish silhouette on the moonlit lawn told him he was far from being one of those creatures. For some odd reason, Earth's stomachs had not evolved in the pleasantly round, downward style his had into a stomach of substance, a stomach in touch with the terrain. Earthlings were like luckless string beans strung up on their latticework of bone and muscle to the very snapping point. While he was a comfortable creature, low slung and contemplative. Musing in this manner, he waddled across the yard to have another strategy meeting with the vegetables, but his large foot depressed the hidden edge of a metal garden tool and its handle rose up toward him at a high rate of speed. It struck him in the head and he fell backward with an intergalactic scream, then dashed into the little patch of corn nearby moments later, the back door opened, and an earthling rushed out with a cowering dog. Elliot charged across the yard, flashlight on, and shone it into the tool shed. The cold beam played over the tools again, and Harvey leapt into the fight, biting a hole in the peat bag, which made him feel much better, but left him with a mouthful of moss. He danced about, somewhat muffled, snapping at shadows. In the corn patch, the extraterrestrial lay crouched, clutching a cucumber, ready to do battle. His teeth were grinding fearfully, and he trembled all over. The corn stalks separated. The boy looked in, screamed, and dove to the earth. The space creature backed off through the corn stalks and hurried for the gate, big feet flapping. Don't go! The boy's voice had the edge of gentleness in it, as young plants have, and the old botanist turned to look at him. Their eyes met. The dog of the house was racing in circles, barking, moss flying out of his mouth. A peculiar diet, thought the elderly space scientist, but did not linger to investigate further. Harvey's teeth flashed in the moonlight, but the boy collared the dog, crying again to the spaceman, Don't go! But the ancient being was already going, out the gate and into the night. Mary woke beneath her iPads and felt the house was tilted somehow on its side. She rose, put on a house coat, and stepped into the shadows of the hall. Voices came to her from the playroom. Often enough, she wondered what they played at in there. 
Posters of beautiful space princesses seemed essential to their pleasure. My babies, she sighed to herself. Then, upon nearing the playroom, she heard Tyler's voice and Steve's and Greg's, the dungeoners whom she'd specifically told to go home. Of course, they'd ignored her command. Of course, they were spending the night and would appear before their own mothers tomorrow, bleary-eyed, acting as if they'd been up all night. I can't take much more of this. She tightened her house coat and prepared to attack, but the door was half open and she saw flashing red light, their homemade laser show, in time to soft music. The effect was soothing, she had to admit, and wasn't it creative? Anyway, it'd certainly give her a headache. Like a wounded camel, she slouched back into the shadows, just as Elliot bolted up the steps and rushed into the playroom. You guys, there was a monster in the backyard! A monster? Hey, I'm getting a real Martian together here. It was a goblin, about three feet tall with long arms. He was in the corn patch. Shut the door before you wake, Mom. The door closed. Mom walked slowly back toward her room. The house wasn't tilted on its side. Elliot was. Tilted all out of shape.